It's great to see you. Are you glad to be here today? Come on. Yeah. I'm so glad you're here. What a great day. And I just want to say hi to everybody online. We have people watching online every single week from the Houston area. And if you're in Houston or if you're traveling to Houston, we want to give you a personal invitation to join us in person. I want to say that we love it that you're watching online. We love connecting with you, but there is no substitute for being here in this place. And we've got plenty of room for you. We want you to join us. There's people watching around the country and then also uh, people watching from other countries around the world. We hear from you uh, on a weekly basis. We're grateful for you and we want you to know that we love you and we're glad you're here. And let's just give a great welcome to everybody who's on our online community today, everybody. Yeah. All right, Grace, we're in a series and the series is called No Matter What. And we were taking these three weeks to look at uh, some parts of the book of Daniel and to answer a really important question. I think it's really important for all of us right now. And here's that question. And that says, how do you live a godly life in an ungodly culture? How do you live a godly life in an ungodly culture? And in these weeks, here's what we have found out. We've looked at together. But the reality is, if you're going to live your life for Jesus right now, in this day, today, you need to know that culture is not going to be for you. It's going to be against you in a lot of ways. And my job, my role, what I want to do, my heart for you is to help give you what you need to stand up for what you believe in, in a culture that may be pressing you to go a different direction. I want to tell you today that that's, uh, that dynamic, that issue is not a new issue for Christ followers through much, in fact, I almost say all of recorded history, people who followed Jesus have had to sometimes stand against a culture that did not like what they believed in, or maybe even like who they believed in. And so there've been moments, scripture's full of them, of God's people having to stand up for what they believe in, in a time when everybody else is going a different direction or a different way. And so my goal in these weeks is to help give us what we need to be able to do that uh, in our day. How do you live a godly life in an ungodly culture? The answer really simply is this, you have to make a no matter what commitment to Jesus. And in these weeks, I've been challenging you to do that. What does it look like to make a commitment to Jesus that's no matter what? No matter, no matter if everybody else is going one way, I'm still going to follow Jesus. No matter if, if, it, if I'm disappointed, I'm still going to follow Jesus. No matter if you make a different decision, I'm still going to follow Jesus. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So it's about that kind of a commitment, everybody. And I want us to, to make that, and, and, and many of you have, but if you're at a place where you just need to to be encouraged in that, or maybe even make that commitment for the first time this series is for you. It's out of the book of Daniel. That's an Old Testament prophet. Daniel was part of a group of God's people who were captured and taken away to a whole different country named Babylon. It is modern day Iraq. That's where Babylon existed. But we looked in this series about Babylon being not just a locality, but a mentality. That the idea, the concepts of what Babylon was about really are still around today. In fact, many of you are facing those kind of things in your everyday life. And so we've talked about how to face those, how to look at them, and how to stand when we need to stand. In the first week, we talked about the culture and how an ungodly culture will try to change your identity. It's going to try to compromise your convictions and create conflict in your life. And then last week, I looked at with you at three actions all of us can take to live a godly life in an ungodly uh, culture. We talked about exalting God even in a culture that celebrates self. And we talked about acknowledging God in a culture that tries to ignore God. And we talked about living a life of humility when so many times we look around and say, man, we are in a culture of insanity. And so that brings us to this week. And so I want you to open a fresh page on your phone or your tablet or your journal. And today's message is titled this, how to stand up in a bow down culture. How to stand up in a bow down culture culture. And this idea, this issue of standing for your faith goes all through the scripture, but I'll show you just one place where the Bible talks about it. First Corinthians 16, 13 and 14, be on guard. In other words, Hey, get your dukes up, Uh, uh, get your eyes open, make sure you're paying attention to what's going on around you. Be on guard, stand firm in the faith. I believe that all through history, God is looking for people like you and me who will stand firm in the faith. In other words, don't stand weak in the faith, stand firm in the faith. Come on. Stand, be strong about what you believe. Be courageous, be strong, uh, but always remember, do everything in love. 
And so we see there again the tension of grace and truth that we are called to live out the love of Jesus, but to also raise high the standard of the truth of Jesus. And I just want to remind you, I want to tell you, I'm so glad you have your Bibles with you, uh, whether they're digital or old school like the one I'm holding. I just want to say you are in a church that stands on the truth of the word of God. This book will not fade away. The truth in this book, you can build your life on, you can build your marriage on, you can build your dreams on, you can build your future on, and it will not fall. God's word lasts forever and forever. And we believe in that. And I know you do too. So we're talking about how to stand, how to stand up, how to stand for that. So in the message today, I'm going to take you through a lot of scripture. We're going to look at almost a whole chapter of scripture in the Bible. And we're going to unpack it as we go. I'm going to comment as we go. And then I'm going to talk to you about four reminders that you and I need in moments when we need to stand up or stand strong for our faith. Daniel 3 describes what happens in an ungodly culture. And so I want to catch you up. Remember, Daniel and his friends were taken captive. They were taken away to Babylon. And what happens in their life in this point has something to teach us. So I'm going to start walking through these scriptures with you. Let's look at it together. You can open your Bible to Daniel chapter 3. King Nebuchadnezzar, he was the king of Babylon, of course, and we read about him and talked about him the last couple of weeks. He made an image of gold. Stop right there. Let me just point out two words to you, and you'll see these all through what we're reading. The word image and the word sound. As we read along through these verses, I just want you to see how many times it says image and sound. Image and sound. Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold, 60 cubits high, six cubits wide, and set it on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. And he then summoned all the satraps, prefects. These are all titles of people who were responsible and leaders. Satraps, prefects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the other provincial officials to come to the dedication of the image he had set up. Let's go on, verse three. So the satraps, prefects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the other provincial officials assembled for the dedication of the image, there it is again, that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up, and they stood before it. Look at what it says in verse four. Story goes on. Then the herald loudly proclaimed. So this was the announcer. The announcer came on the PA system, loudly proclaimed nations and people of every language. This is what you are commanded to do. As soon as you hear the sound, see that word of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music, you must fall down and worship the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Verse six, just to encourage everybody, whoever does not fall down in worship will immediately be thrown into a blazing furnace. Therefore, as soon as they heard the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, all kinds of music, all the nations, the people of every language fell down and they worshiped the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. So let me just stop here and just point out a couple of things to you. And then I want to dig into our story. I said that this talks about an ungodly culture, and let me just share with you this, that cultures are built on images and sounds. Here the Bible shows us that what happens in this moment is that Nebuchadnezzar, he didn't even want them to worship him, he wanted them to worship an image. There was an image that the culture set up, and it was big, and it was domineering, and it was dominant on the landscape, and he gathers everybody together. And, and then, so there's not only an image, but there's a sound. There's an image and a sound, an image and a sound. Every culture operates on images and sounds. And so there's an image they want you to worship and a sound that they want you to play. And the sound is the trigger to worship the image. And that's how it works. That's how it operates. And it still operates that today. Uh, cultures are defined by images and sounds. And so Nebuchadnezzar sets up this image, this golden image, and then they have this sound. They have all these instruments and everybody plays all this music and people bow down. I imagine in your mind's eye, like a football field full of people standing shoulder to shoulder. And you've got all the who's who's there, all the important people, all of the people with responsibility. Everybody is there and there's this huge image that the culture has set up and, and then there's these instructions. When the sound plays, make sure that you bow down. And, and so the sound plays and everybody bows down and, and they bow and they worship this image. Except for three guys. There are three guys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who do not bow with everybody else. 
We're talking about living a stand up, being able to stand up in a bow down culture. Let's look at them. So they don't bow down. I mean, think about how, how, how this plays out. Everybody bows down, but them. And some of the other officials, while they're bowing down, they look and they see they're not they're, Hey, they're not bowing down over there. Did you see that? Look at them. They're not bowing down over there. Can you believe they're not bowing down? They're not bowing down. They're not bowing down. They're not bowing down. They're not bowing down. We have to go tell King Nebuchadnezzar and that's what they do. So they get up and they go tell King Nebuchadnezzar and we pick up the story, skip down a few verses to verse 12. Here's what it says. These officials came and they said, there are some Jews whom you've set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who pay no attention to you, your majesty. They neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold that you've set up. So these three guys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they don't bow when everybody else bows. The ungodly culture wants you to serve their gods, worship their images, but they choose not to bow. And here's what I find really interesting, and I highlighted it for you right here. Look what it says. There are some Jews. Now, I want to talk about this word. There are some Jews. In fact, I want you to say the word some together, but there are some Jews. I'm, I need you to see what it does not say. It does not say, but there are all the Jews. It just says some Jews. Now, what that leads us to believe is that in this moment on this football field, when they had this image and they played the music and everybody bowed down, there were people bowing who were Babylonians, but there were people bowing who were part of other cultures. And there were Jews, God's people, who were also bowing. Because we saw earlier on that they had captured the entire nation, displaced it, brought it back to, to Babylon there in modern day Iraq. And they'd taken the nation and they'd taken the top, the, the strongest, best looking, smartest people that were capable and they'd infiltrated them into the government to be serving. So while Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, these three young men stood up in a moment when everybody else bowed, they weren't the only Jews there. You, oh, come on, over here, okay. Listen, let me tell you what happened. They weren't the only Jews there. So here's what that means. Sometimes you're gonna have to take a stand, and there are moments when you have to take a stand where even people who believe what you believe maybe aren't taking the same stand that you're taking, okay? So here, they don't bow down, so the officials, they go to the king and they say, look, look at these guys. They're not bowing. Now, why, now, you see what they did. That stands out. But I also want to point out what they did not do. And this is so important. They did not make fun of everybody in the crowd. They didn't stand there and ridicule people. They did not uh, 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 make fun of the king. They didn't denigrate others. They didn't point their finger. The Bible says this, that they stood because they were standing on a conviction, but they stood in a certain way. And here's what I want you to see. And you need to put this in your notes and put it in your heart. You can be respectful and convictional at the same time. You can be con respectful and convictional at the same time. You're going to see later on that when they're talking to the king, they still address him as sir. These men were respectful of his position. They were respectful of where they were, but they were also convictional. This is so important. This balance is so necessary. See, uh, many people are so worried about being respectful of everybody else and their opinions and their ideas and what they want that they compromise their convictions in the process. In other words, I'm so worried about what you're going to think. I don't even stand up for the truth when I'm supposed to stand up because I'm trying to respect everyone. Now, I'm not here to say be disrespectful. You saw that. I'm here to say be loving in the way that Jesus was loving. But Jesus was full of grace and he was full of truth. You can be respectful and convictional. These guys stood for their convictions, didn't even move, but they did it in a respectful way. Then there's other people that are totally convictional, but they are so disrespectful, you don't hear a word they're saying. Ever met somebody like that? They say the right thing, but they put it in such an ugly package, it's hard to swallow. So, the, so what we're called to be is respectful and convictional at the same time. This is what these guys did. Let's look on. Daniel 3 and 13, 14, and 15. Here's what the Bible says. Then Nebuchadnezzar, he was in a terrible rage. So it's very much upset the king. So he ordered Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to be brought in before him. So the king brings them in before him. Verse 14. Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, he demanded that you're refusing to serve my gods 
or to worship the gold statue that I set up. Verse 15, I'll give you one more chance. Come on, any parent in here ever given your kid one more chance? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to count to three. One, two, two and a half. All right. Uh, when the music plays, if you fall down and worship the statue, all will be well. But if you refuse, you'll be thrown into the flaming furnace within the hour. And what God can deliver you out of my hands then? So let's look at what happens here. The ungodly culture wants compliance. It wants you to bow to it. At the end of the day, the image is set up, but the purpose of the image is to get these people to worship someone other than God. And so what happens is uh, the, the ungodly culture starts raising the stakes. Hey, I think there's a misunderstanding. Hey, I think that you just don't understand. Hey, I think you're just ignorant in your beliefs. You need to be brought around to our way of thinking. Let me explain it to you again. We're going to play the music. You're going to bow down and everything will be well. Just apologize. Just say you're sorry for what you did. Obviously, it was a mistake. We can't make room for the fact that anybody could worship another God other than the God of our culture. So it was a mistake. So you just need to own that. You need to bow down when the music plays. Everything's going to be fine. But if you don't, we're going to throw you in the furnace. If you don't, we're going to get rid of you. If you don't, we're going to marginalize you. If, we're don't, if you don't, we're going to make your voice small. If you don't, we're, we're, we're going to take you out. That's what happens here. And so Nebuchadnezzar does this explanation, which is exactly what an ungodly culture does. And yet these guys still stand. And I'm going to take the rest of this message to talk to you about uh, four reminders you need when you stand for God. So, but it starts with this question and that's this, how do you know when you need to stand for your faith? How do you know? Because that's what happens here. And if I'm here to say that that can happen in your life, how do you know when you're at a moment where you need to stand for your faith? I'm really glad you asked. Let me help you with that. Here's how you know. You know you're at a moment when you need to stand for your faith when the culture and your discipleship for Jesus cross. When the culture's going one way and the Bible's going another way and they cross, that may be a moment where you need to carry your cross. That's a moment where you have to stand. Now, here's what I'm not saying. I don't want you to hear what I'm not saying. I'm not saying that you take a stand on every preference in life. I'm not saying that you take a stand on things that don't matter. I'm not saying you just become a person who wants everything your way all the time. Here's what I'm saying. When the culture and the word of God cross, you are a person who belongs to God and you are called to stand in that moment. I want to show you how. You're called to be respectful, but also be convictional. Here's how. You do it. How, what does that mean in our life? There's probably not going to be a huge gold statue and a football field full of people for you to bow down to, but I want to tell you what it could be for you. Making a stand could be being honest at work when everybody else shades the truth and calls it sales. I got somebody's number. It could be that standing means being faithful in your relationships when people around you aren't. It could be that standing for you is not going to certain places or being around certain people that are going a different direction. It could be that standing for you means keeping your convictions even if you don't fit in. It might be that standing for you means living uh, for a purpose that's bigger than self because that always goes against a selfish culture. So I want to give you four reminders because I really believe that we're at a moment where God's people need to know how and when to stand for your faith. So put these in your notes. Number one, here we go. Taking notes, write this down. If you're not taking notes, write it down. Number one, standing firm takes courage. Standing firm takes courage. Daniel three sixteen. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied. This was their answer. So Nebuchadnezzar says, obviously, we've had a failure to communicate. We're going to play the music again. You need to bow. We'll throw you in the furnace. Here's their reply. They replied, oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we are not worried about what will happen to us. We aren't worried. We are not worried. Now, I would submit to you that that's not the same thing as saying we have no fear. 
Because I believe that in every moment where we are called to stand, there is an element of fear. In fact, I think that's what pushes back on most of us. And in many cases, when we feel a little bit of fear, we say, that must be God leading me not to do this. (laughs) But I'm here to tell you at every moment where it's time to stand, there's always going to be a little bit of fear. They didn't say that we don't have any fear. They said, we're not worried about what's going to happen to us. That's a difference. Why could they say we're not worried about what's going to happen to us? Here's the reason why. Because when you believe in Jesus, while you may endure difficulty here and challenges here, you know the one you belong to ultimately and that he's in charge of your life. This is another way of them saying, we don't need to back down because we know who's in charge of our life. The New Testament, Paul said it this way. They came to Paul and they threatened him. They said, Paul, if you don't quit preaching, we're going to beat you. He said, I've already been beaten. Paul, if you don't quit preaching, we're going to throw you in prison. That's a great idea because I was witnessing to this guard in the prison. And if I go back there, I think I can get him saved. Paul, if you don't quit preaching, we're not going to beat you right there in prison. We're going to kill you. We're going to take you out. Well, I really wish you would, because I've been wrestling with this thing. I was up in the third heaven and I had this image. And the fact of the matter is that for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. So if you take my life, that only means I'm going to be in the presence of Jesus anyway. That's what you call a no lose situation. That's what these guys are in. So they had courage. So it takes courage. But in a moment of standing, you cannot eliminate fear. You're always going to have a little bit of uh, fear when you stand up. But God can use you in a great way when you make a stand. I learned this early on in my Christian life. I, got, I came to Christ when I was 16, and I really wanted to make a difference, and, and I felt like I needed to, to make a stand for my faith at my school. I graduated from Kool Lake High School just uh, down the road here, and I was part of the church here. I was part of the youth ministry, and I was at a youth service And somebody talked about starting a campus group on your school campus, like being brave enough in your faith to really go public and start a group on your school campus, the purpose to strengthen Christians and also to witness to people who didn't know Jesus. And I really felt like God stirred me to do that and to be part of that. And so that's what I did. I I began leading a campus group on our school campus. And in my junior year, it started growing. And in my senior year, it grew to be the largest campus group on the campus of Clear Lake High School. It was the biggest group. The biggest group was the Christian group. And that was during a time where there was a lot of legal uh, questions about whether students could even gather together and pray or gather together and talk about God. And there was a lot of pressure. And so it really did mean standing up. In fact, it was, it actually became a, a, a swelling issue in our nation, which led to a Supreme Court case which defended the rights of Christian students to express their faith at their campus. Uh, Essentially, what the court case said was, if you can gather before or after school to study math, you can gather before or after school to study the Bible, which makes a lot of sense to me, by the way. I was a part of that. And I'm holding right now a Time magazine from uh, December of 1991. And here's the cover. Look at this. Here's what it says. One nation under God has the separation of church and state gone too far. I just wanted to show you that today because I think you could just change the date and it's the same message. In fact, you could even change the top. This says the recession, what Bush can do, just change the name of the president and we're all set. We're ready to go. (laughs) Some things never change. The cover story was about the conflict of whether students should be able to share their faith. And the picture for the cover story inside is my campus group from Kool Lake High School. There's me right there. We had so many students gathering that they couldn't gather around the place where the flagpole was because they were standing in the bus lane and no kids could get off the bus to go to school. So we had to do our own flagpole behind the school so that we could fit everybody because there were so many people who came out to pray. And that's what we were doing right there. And incidentally, Elisha told me that that t-shirt right there would be cool today. So, you know, I'm cool today. I was cool back then. That's what I want to say to you. (laughs) This was all about a conflict and a culture that wanted to get you to bow down. And in the middle of that, God challenged me to stand up. And not just me. There were students all over the country and there were students part of our church. I think it's awesome to be part of a church that challenges students to stand for their faith and backs them up when they do. Don't you? Aren't you glad you're part of a church that's like that, that believes in that? 
takes courage. So I just say this to you. Don't let fear hold you back. And don't wait until fear is gone to do what God's told you to do. Because it may never go away totally. Second reminder, standing firm takes faith. So we're back in the story now. Here's what happens. They go on with their answer. If we're thrown into the flaming furnace, our God is able to deliver us. Now, this could be the whole message today. Four words. Our God is able. Right there, that's faith defined. How do you define faith? I'm struggling with what faith means. Here's what it means. Our God is able. Our God is able. Able. And in places in my life, in your life, where we struggle with being obedient to God, could it be that we're actually struggling with believing that God is able in that area? In places where we are practical unbelievers, in other words, we say we believe, but we live like we don't, could it be that we are struggling with God being able to take care of us in that moment, in that situation? And I believe today there's nothing wrong with saying that you're struggling, but I am here to say this to you. I believe. Part of the message today right here are these four words for you. Our God is able. Our God is able. Our God is able. If you're here today and you're struggling in your marriage, our God is able to heal your marriage. Do it God's way. He will bless it and his hand will be on it. I believe our God is able. If you're here today and you're struggling in your family, let me just tell you, you've got a son, you've got a daughter that's walked away from the faith. I believe our God is able to bring them back and restore them to their faith. Our God's able. If you're here today, you're struggling in obeying God or stepping out in faith. If you're here today and you're struggling in your business, you're here today and you need a miracle, I believe our God is able. If you're here today and you need a healing, I believe you come to the right place because our God is able to heal what hurts you in your life. In every area, any area, our God is able. You're struggling with obeying God and honoring him with a tithe, our God is able to provide for you. You just need to know today that he's able. Standing firm takes faith. It also takes commitment. Let's look on. Here's what it says. But if he doesn't, understand this, sir, that even then we will never under any circumstances serve your gods or worship the golden statue that you have erected. Let me just say <laughs> this to you. Never under any circumstances, never under any circumstances will we worship someone other than our God. You got to have a commitment. You got to have a commitment in a moment where everybody's bowing. If you're going to stand, it's going to take a commitment. Never under any circumstances. I love their boldness. I love them saying, you know what? It doesn't matter what you do. This is not a changeable in my life. You need to know serving God isn't a preference. It's not an opinion. Serving God is who I am, and it's not going to change under any circumstance. I made a no matter what commitment to God. And it may turn out that I am disappointed or I go through struggles or I go through storms, but I'm not going to let that be the regulator on my relationship with God. In other words, I'm mature enough to know I may go through some tough times, but that's not going to have me question who God is. I'm going to say, thank you, God, that you go with me through those tough times. You can't make me bow. You cannot make me give up my faith in Jesus. You can't make me do it. We need to have a no matter what commitment. So let me just ask you, do you have one of those? Have you made one of those? I think in many ways, and I mean, just take it if it's yours. I think that a lot of people are just scared to step out in their faith because they don't want to be disliked on social media. The culture may not like you if you stand for God, but if you stand for God in the right way, you will always make a difference. And that's what we're called to do. So standing firm takes faith, it takes faith and commitment. Number three, third reminder, standing firm is never standing alone. Never standing alone. Daniel 3, 22. So here's what happens. Nebuchadnezzar, he gets very upset. And in his anger, he tells them to heat the furnace up even hotter. I mean, it was already hot. He said, make it hotter, 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 make it hotter. And then he has the guards bind them to throw them in the furnace. They open the furnace door. We pick up the story in verse 22. And because the king in his anger had demanded such a hot fire in the furnace, the flames leaped out and they killed the soldiers that were throwing them in. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego fell down, bound into the roaring flames. But suddenly, 
As he was watching, Nebuchadnezzar jumped up in amazement and exclaimed to his advisors, didn't we throw three men into the furnace? Yes, they said, we did indeed, your majesty. Well, look, Nebuchadnezzar shouted, I see four men unbound and walking around in the fire and they aren't even hurt by the flames and the fourth looks like God. Can I preach this a minute? Just for a minute, all right? This, many Bible scholars believe, and I happen to agree, that this is a Christophany. A Christophany is a Bible word for a pre-appearance of Jesus before the New Testament. That literally Jesus was in heaven, but before he came in bodily form, there were moments in the Old Testament where he showed up and intervened, and this was one of those moments. And they exist to show us his character and nature so that when he shows up, we don't miss him when he arrives. Here's one of them. And I love this because here's what Jesus, I mean, I just imagine this in my mind that Jesus is in heaven and he sees Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, these young guys, he sees them standing up for God and standing up for their faith. And he sees Nebuchadnezzar throw them in the furnace and there they are. And he says, oh no, 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 I can't let them stand there alone. There's no way I'm going to allow them to go through that fire by themselves. I've got to step down out of heaven into the furnace with them so that I can be with them in this moment. I understand that it isn't my time yet to go walk the earth and to carry the cross, but I've got to take a moment and hit pause and I got to get down there because I got three guys that are standing in a fire and I won't let them be by themselves. Here's what I love about this, everybody. And that's this, that if you stand firm, you'll never stand by yourself. You might feel like you are alone, but even if you feel like you're alone, you are not. And one of the enemy's greatest tactics is to isolate you and me and make us feel like we're by ourselves, like you're the only one. If you stand up for Jesus at your high school, you'll be the only one. Everybody make fun of you. If you live for God at work and you say you're a Christian and you follow what the Bible says, you'll be the only one and everybody will make fun of you. Hey, if you try, look at what the culture has discovered about how to live a a fulfilling life and you want to do what the Bible says, everybody's going to make fun of you. Here's what I'm here to tell you. If you live God's way and you stand for God, you will never stand alone. Jesus will always stand with you. Can I go one more minute, please? Okay. So look at this. Look at this part of the story. Here's Jesus and Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego in the furnace, right? Okay. And then outside you have Nebuchadnezzar. You got all the people who are in charge. And then you have the football field full of people who are all bowing down to the idol. And here they are. And so here's Jesus and three guys in the fire. And then you have thousands of people in the crowd. And when I look at that and I think to myself, where is the majority? Here's what I'm here to tell you. Jesus and three men in a fire is a bigger majority than thousands of people on the outside. Standing firm is never standing alone. And by the way, in case you were ever at a moment where you thought you were by yourself, why don't you just look around this place and realize that you're part of grace. And because you are part of grace, there are thousands of people in this service and the one before this and the one after this who are all standing with you if you stand for God. You will never ever stand by yourself. Oh yeah. And the book of Hebrews tells us in Hebrews chapter 12, that not only are you standing with the thousands of believers who are here, not only are you standing with thousands of believers around the nation, not only are you standing with thousands, hundreds of thousands of believers around the world who believe in Jesus. When you stand for Jesus, you are also standing with all of those believers who have gone before you because the Bible says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off the sin that so easily entangles us and let's run the race that Jesus has set before us. In other words, all of heaven is in the stands cheering for you when you stand for God. So you never stand alone. You never stand alone. Even if you feel alone, you aren't alone. Stand for your faith. Stand firm for your beliefs and your convictions. Number four, fourth reminder. Put this in your notes. Standing firm impacts others. We read on. Verse 28. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, here was his response after seeing this. Nebuchadnezzar said, blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. For he sent his angel to deliver his trusting servants when they defied the king's commandments and were willing to die rather than to serve or worship any God except their own. Therefore, I make this decree that any person 
of any nation, language, or religion who speaks a word against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be torn limb from limb and his house knocked into a heap of rubble. For no other God can do what this one can do. No other God can do what this one does. They made an impact. I don't believe that in the moment when they had to choose whether to bow or not, that they thought, you know what, if we stand, we're going to end up in front of the king. He's going to try to throw us in the furnace. Jesus is going to come up. He's going he's to take care of everything. Then we're going to walk out of the furnace, and then we're going to get to witness to the king. I don't think they saw the whole story. And I'm here to tell you, in moments when you need to stand for your faith, you may not see the whole story. God sees the whole story, but we don't always get to. I think our choice is not about trying to figure out the whole story. Our choice is about, is this my moment to stand? And when we stand, listen, when you stand, listen, when you obey God, you can trust him with the results of that obedience. And that's what happened here. Standing firm impacts others. Let me show you five groups of people that were impacted. First, the king. They changed his view of their God. Second, they impacted the leaders of the nation. They all had a respect for Jehovah after this. Third, they impacted the other people who were around that saw them standing. Fourth, they impacted their families and gave others courage to stand too. And last, they impacted you and me. Because today we read their story out of the Bible. And it encourages you and me to stand, and not just you and me, but other generations of believers all through since the scripture was written have been encouraged to stand for their faith because of three guys who were willing to stand in a moment where culture told them to bow. Standing impacts others. That's why we're called to stand, everybody. That's why we're called to live a life that stands up for God. And if you ask me, well, let me ask you a question, G. What would have happened what if they stood? And what if the king called them to stand in front of him? And what if they threw these three guys in the furnace? And what if they died? What would have happened? What would have happened if they died? What if that was the end of the story? Here's what I would tell you. First off, they still would have been rewarded. The Bible says here that they prospered uh, greatly in the province of Babylon because of, they were promoted in this life. And you say, man, that story sounds really awesome, but what if you stood up and what if they threw you in the furnace and what if that was the end? I would say this, they would still be in the Bible. And here's how you know. They might not appear in the book of Daniel, but they would certainly appear in Hebrews chapter 11 because the Bible says that some for their faith were sawn in two. Some for their faith gave their lives. Some for their faith were martyred for what they believed. And these received an even greater honor in eternity. See, they saw something that maybe we need to be reminded of. And that's this. That this life is brief. James says it's like a puff of smoke. <laughs> that this life is, can be here, it's so fragile, it can be here and then gone. But what we choose in this life has an impact on eternity. And the fact of the matter is that you and I, because we believe in Jesus, when we close our eyes in this life, we will open our eyes in eternity with him. And so if I'm going to live my life, listen, I don't want to live it just for what happens on this earth because this is here today and gone tomorrow. I've got to live my life for what heaven has to say about me. I don't really care about your opinion of my decisions and what you think about everything. I want to know what God thinks. Why? Because I'm going to spend forever with him. And however I leave this life, if it is like these guys described and God delivers me out of the fire or if the fire takes me and I end up to be in the presence of Jesus, I win either way and my life matters because it belongs to him. Standing up in a bow down culture. Standing firm takes courage. Standing firm takes faith. Standing firm is never standing alone. Standing firm impacts others. My closing challenge for you in this series is to open your heart to Jesus if you haven't done so. And I wrote one more statement out of this whole concept, this whole idea of Jesus being in the fire with us. Because I do want to pray for people who feel like they're in a fire right now, in a, in a pressure cooker, in a difficult spot. But look at this. Jesus went through the fire with you when you had to. 
That's what happened here. These guys got thrown in the fire and Jesus said, you're not gonna do it alone. But here's what else I wanna show you. He went to the cross for you when you couldn't go. Jesus went through the fire with you when you had to go. And he went to the cross for you when you couldn't go. Because the Bible says you couldn't do enough good. You couldn't sacrifice enough. You couldn't make it on your own between the distance between you and God. Something had to happen. And Jesus saw that. And when you couldn't go, when you couldn't make up that distance, he gave his life on the cross for you and me to bridge the gap so we could have a relationship with God. And so today, yeah. So today, I want to pray with you. I'm going to pray two ways at the end here. One is to open your heart to the love of God. Two is to challenge all of us to make a no matter what commitment to Jesus and stand for it. But I want to start with opening your heart to Jesus. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads in the room. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads online. Please give me this moment to pray with you. A decision for Christ is personal. No one else can make it for you. You have to make it for yourself. My question is, do you have a real relationship with Jesus? Maybe through this series, you've heard about him. Maybe you've heard more about him. Maybe as we've unpacked that and looked at who he is, it's impacted you. The gospel is simply this. Jesus is God's son. He came to the earth. He lived a perfect life. He died on the cross, a horrible death for you and me, and he was raised again. And all of that put together made a way for you and I to have a real relationship with God. It isn't about what you do. It's about what he did. And so today, I want to pray with you to open your heart to Jesus if you need to do that. I'm going to ask you before we pray to lift your hand and hold it up. I'm going to count to three. I'm going to ask for hands to go up. We're going to hold them up just for a moment. I'm going to tell you to put your hands down. Then we're going to pray together. I'm going to lead you. Everybody in the room is going to pray this prayer together out loud. But before we do, I want a moment just to see who I'm praying with. I want to meet you hand to hand. So my hand's in the air right now. If you need to make a personal decision for Jesus, you're here in the room, or even if you're online, you're sitting on the floor, you're up in the risers, I'm gonna count to three. I want your hand to go up. This is your moment of decision, your time to choose. If you wanna say yes to Jesus, I wanna help you. Here we go. One, two, three. Raise your hand and hold it up high. Hold it up high, hold it up high, all around this room. My hand's up and I'm looking around. And I want everybody else's head bowed but I wanna see you. Hold your hand up high. Come on, everybody. If you need to be in part of that prayer. There's people all over, online too. Just lift your hand before God, right where you are. And you can put your hands down all over this place. Let me lead you in a prayer. Like I said, I want everybody to pray this out loud. So I wanna hear you pray. If it's your first time to pray this prayer, it's okay, I've got you. I'm gonna take you phrase by phrase through it. It's a prayer real similar to the one that I prayed to come to Jesus in my own life. Here we go, let's pray this way together. It's a good reaffirmation for everybody who already has faith in Jesus. Let's pray together. Dear Jesus, I come to you and I believe in you. I believe that you died on the cross and I believe that you rose again. So I ask you to forgive me and I receive your gift of forgiveness that covers my mistakes and my failures Your forgiveness covers my sins and I thank you for it. Now make me new from the inside out. I pray in Jesus' name. I put my hand in yours and I begin a relationship right now with you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And amen. Hey, what a great prayer, everybody. What a great prayer. Now, before we go, I believe there are people all across this room and all of us really that just need to make the declaration. We're going to have a no matter what commitment. We're going to live a godly life, even in an ungodly culture. Hey, when we go out these doors, we're going to live for God out there every day each day, in our family, in our workplace, in our community, we're going to stand up for what we believe in. And if we end up in a fire, we know that we won't be there all alone. He will be with us. I want us to declare that today. So this is more of a commitment and a prayer and a song all at the same time. I want you to stand to your feet. Would you do that? Stand to your feet right where you are. We're going to take the next few minutes. We're going to worship Jesus with this song right here. The words are going to be on the screen. I want you to pick those up. I want you to sing this out, sing it out loud, lift your hands, 
worship God in this moment. Then we'll come back and close the service in just a moment. But we need to declare this, everybody, as a church, as individuals, over our lives, our families, and where we are. Let's worship with the team today. What an amazing message and an so good. amazing way to end the series, yes. right? Uh, no matter what, I love it. It's challenged me. It's encouraged me that no matter what comes against me, no matter what uh, opposition I may face, that I want right. to stand for Jesus. Yeah. I want to stand for who God is. This message was so timely right. for just what we've been living right. through the last right, right, right. almost two years now. Right, right. One of the things that stuck out to me, he was talking about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and in the furnace, and he's saying, I'd rather be the three with Jesus than the big crowd around without Jesus. So and good. For me, I, that's how I want to be. I mean, the goal is that everybody would know the Lord, right? But that the people that I surround myself and the people that I'm around are the ones that are going to stand for righteousness and stand so for true. the things that are uh, what the gospel is saying, yeah. right? So it's encouraging and, and yes. I love it. Well, if you decided to give your heart to the Lord, know that we are celebrating come with on. you. We are so excited to come alongside and right. partner with you right. as you continue to seek the Lord. And so we just want you to text the word, I believe, to mm -hmm. 797979. Right. That way we can have our team follow up with you. We're ready to call you and pray with you and just to help you on this journey. And, right. um, and so know that we are so excited for what the Lord's just beginning to do in your life. Right. We got so much going on this week. That's true. Come I'm on. so excited. We we launched Love Week yes, today. Small groups. There's been so many people donating blood. Come we got on. small groups happening. Yeah. Uh, just a reminder, go to mygrace.com for the most up-to-date information. Right, you right. can click on Love Week if you want to volunteer this week and register. Yes. You and your family are able to join me at the Houston Food Bank tomorrow night. Come We're going on. out. Um, but there's several opportunities throughout the week so you can get connected. Right. And the reason we're able to do so much here at Grace 
place is because you continue to be faithful in your yeah. tithes and your offering and worshiping God that way. So there's a few ways that you can give. You go to mygrace.com and view it there. Give there. You can also text giving uh, with the amount that you want to give to 77296. That's very convenient, very easy. You can yes. always mail your gift. That's you and true. AJ love to do that. I love uh, licking the stamps. <laughs> right, right, exactly. And then there's the giving boxes here in the lobby that you can do once you start coming to church in person. Um, one thing I wanted to do, it's your anniversary. It is. Happy anniversary. Thank you. Drop it in the chat. Let her know. Happy anniversary. 13 years. 13 years. That's a long time. I know time. I look like I got married just yesterday, right, but right, right, 13 right. years. Happy anniversary. Thank well, you. Grace family, we love you so much. Thank you so much for joining us on this Sunday. We cannot wait to see you in person. We have equipped classes this Wednesday that we want to see you at. If not, yes. we'll see you online next Sunday.